We all struggle with feeling like there's not enough time in the day to be productive personally or professionally. We all struggle to make our time matter. It's time to take control. It's time to start investing in the corporation of you. At Athena, they've helped over 700 ambitious professionals achieve more by connecting them with best in class globally remote executive assistants. Athena executive assistants go beyond basic administration tasks. They help you make time matter through the art of delegation. They believe delegation is the superpower of all highly successful people. And your personal EA will help you get there. Your EA is a one on one long term partner to help you achieve your personal and professional goals. Take back your time. Join the waitlist at athenago.com. That's athenago.com. My favorite thing about working in healthcare is the people. This industry brings together brilliant, highly motivated individuals who are driven by the opportunity to make a difference. My name is Hallie Teko, and this is The Heart of Healthcare a podcast where I'll be introducing you to the people on the ground, moving the needle in public health and medicine. Reports of systemic racism in the healthcare system and COVID-19 has made the issue even more urgent. Doctors are bringing this concern to light, saying black and brown patients are treated differently. There is a shortage of black practitioners. Blacks make up more than 13% of the U.S. population, but only 4%, just 4% of the nation's doctors. Health disparities run so deep in this country that your zip code is a better predictor of your health than your genetic code. Research has shown that the conditions we face as we live, learn, and work or what researchers call the social determinants of health, have a lot to do with our health. Health disparities are inequities and health opportunities that can be prevented, yet are faced with systemic and institutional barriers. It's lack of access to insurance, nutritious food, clean water, reliable public transportation, a good education, or even just culturally sensitive healthcare providers. Achieving health equity would mean creating a system in which individuals are able to achieve their highest level of health. So how do we disentangle decades of regressive policies that lessen the health barriers populations are faced with today? We know disparities are present in healthcare, but how do we go from theory to practice? On today's episode, we will be speaking with Dr. Ebony Jade Hilton, who is advocating for just that. Dr. Hilton is an anesthesiologist at the University of Virginia, Charlottesville. Before this, she was the first Black woman anesthesiologist to be hired at the Medical University of South Carolina since it opened in 1824. But her work extends far beyond the walls of the hospital. She is a vocal supporter of health equity, advocating for underserved and marginalized populations. She is a regular on-air advocate and medical consultant for national media outlets like MSNBC and CNN. Dr. Hilton is also a children's book author of the AVA series, which demonstrates the power of positive thinking, and the book, We're Going to Be Okay, a children's book about the pandemic. Dr. Hilton, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. (laughs) So tell us about your background and what ultimately led you to the work that you do today. Right. You know, I tell everyone all the time, I feel like I'm just a country girl. So um, I was born in the middle of three girls. um, And when my little sister was eight years old, she asked my mom whether or not we could have a little brother. And that was at that time my mom told us that their first child was actually a little boy, um, that she and my father, they were in high school when when they became pregnant, went to a clinic. had some tests done when she was six months pregnant and she felt a sharp pain, started to leak fluid. The clinic told her everything was okay, but within a couple of days, she ended up going to labor. So um, my brother, who would have been 43 years old this year, um, lived to be three days old and passed away. And so that was the first, she didn't go into that great of detail, but that was my first introduction to medicine and what made me want to be a doctor. Yeah. Wow. You, you went to College of Charleston and graduated early, right? Yeah. Well, actually, I graduated in four years, but I got three degrees. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, so early, yes. I, for three degrees, most people take seven, eight years. Right. Yeah. It was just, I mean, I 
have been very fortunate in life to always stumble into people who um, are as passionate. And I had a little collection of nerds and we were all super geeked out about chemistry. Um, yeah, chemistry and, and biology. So I think it was probably at least five of us that um, we all triple majored that year. And you were pre-med the whole time. Right. Yeah. And and by pre-med, I didn't know what that was, right? So, I, I mean, my parents, my, my parents didn't even graduate from high school. So um, literally everything I've kind of learned along the way, I didn't mm. know what pre-med was. I knew I wanted to be a doctor. I didn't even know what a doctor was. I didn't have a, I didn't have a pediatrician growing up. Um, if we're completely honest, I don't even Wait, think sorry, I was Wait, sorry, you didn't have a pediatrician growing up? <laughs> no. I, I there mean, was no access to, no, to healthcare? I, I, it was one of those things where my mom, um, if you have to choose between feeding your family and paying a copay every single time, food and shelter will win over. And and that's the problem we're seeing 40 years later. It's the same thing. Yeah. Especially, mm-hmm. I mean, you were healthy, so there wasn't right. a problem. If there was a problem, she, yeah, would have made the trek. It completely. Wow. So right. how old were you when you first met a doctor? <laughs> And it's kind of, well, so I used to get strep throat. And this is another thing that talks about disparities, right? Uh, my sisters and I, especially my, my younger sister, we used to get strep throat all the time. Uh, and so we didn't have a pediatrician, but we were very frequent to the um, urgent care or to, you know, the um, mm. doc in a box kind of places. Yeah. And that was our experience of medicine. It was when you were truly sick. I finally got my tonsils removed, actually, when I was in um, medical school. And people say, oh, my God, why did you wait so late? Because I couldn't afford it. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. I had kissing tonsils. Um, and and so, yeah, I got them removed when I was 24. Yeah. So after you learned mm-hmm. what, what doctors do, you still wanted to be one. Right, right. <laughs> and it's because it's one of those things. I grew up in medicine. And to be honest with you, it has taken that naive state of thinking, oh, all, all doctors are like Dr. Quinn, medicine woman, because that was my only representation, to realizing that there are some deep-rooted problems within the medical system that allows for the same disparities that took the life of my brother to exist today, and that my child is, is twice as likely than a white woman with a third-grade education to die before their first birthday. The system has not changed with the times, unfortunately. So. Your career in medicine, well, first I want to hear kind of how you ended up specializing in anesthesiology, um, but also kind of when you kind of added advocacy to your resume, is that something that started in med school before, since you started practicing? Uh, but first, let's talk about how you kind of ended up specializing. Right. You know, because again, I had no clue what a doctor did. So I assumed all doctors did all things. And call it lack of preparation to figure that out before med school. But I honestly went in thinking that all specialties would keep in mind that we're treating all people. Um, And so when I was Mm. doing my rotation um, during third year, I was like, every rotation, I felt like, oh, I like a little piece of this and I like a little piece of that. And OBGYN was my very last rotation. And thinking about my brother, I figured that's what I would probably want to go into if I had to specialize into just one group of persons. When I finally arrived on OB, I felt like, you know, something is missing. We were delivering babies of 13, 14 year olds and asking them if you're going to breast or bottle feed and not getting to the root of what led you here, right? We didn't have time. Mm -hmm. It was 40 people a day that you were seeing. And I wanted to stay in the room and be able to say, do you feel safe at home? You know, what has happened? that has led to this? How can we be of service? But the business of medicine takes away that humanity sometimes. But um, anyway, but my my last night on OB, um, there was a woman who came in e- eclamptic. So she w- eclampsia is when you have very high blood pressure and, and the, it ends to the point of you literally having seizures. And so um, the lady was having a seizure, unfortunately. And this guy came in the room and he started just barking orders. He was like, you start the A-line, you give the magnesium, you do this, you do that. And I turned to the resident. I was like, who is this guy? And she was like, oh, that's the anesthesia resident. I was like, but why is he here? She was like, well, it's a code. I was like, but why is he running the code? Because they were OB attendings. You know, attendings are, you know, the top of the, of the chain. And 
they were listening to him. And I said, that's what I want to be. I want to, <laughs> I want to be that person. I want to be the boss. <laughs> I want to be that person because I wanted to be set in a situation where I knew in life that if something was happening to my family, I would be the person people turn to, to keep them alive. And mm-hmm. that was what he, what Matt was that day. So yeah, that was my last mm-hmm. week of third year. So I had to change my entire um, resume um, and my letters of recommendation and my personal wow. statement over from OB to anesthesia within a week to apply for residency. So yeah, yeah. but you made it. I did. And- <laughs> It's kind of crazy. It's, um, you know, this wasn't too long ago. You're still quite young and you were still the first black woman that MUSC had hired in anesthesiology. It is incredible. And even that, again, I say I stumble into things all along because at church we were doing um, having a Black History Month presentation and I really wanted to find the the black woman who paved the way for me. So I went to my chair Mm. and I said, you know, do you know um, who was the black you know, the first black female anesthesiologist, maybe she's still alive. Hopefully I can talk to her. And he said, well, I don't know. Um, he was like, let's ask Cal and uh, Cal Alpert, the oldest anesthesiologist at, at MUSC. He's fantastic, but he had been there forever. Mm. And he's like our historian of our, de- our, our department. And so we went to go talk to him and he kind of looks at me and tilts his head. And he was like, you know what, let me get back to you tomorrow. I just want to check and make sure of something. I was like, okay, I figured it was, you know, maybe something personal or that maybe something that happened to um, a friend or so. But the next day he came to me, he was like, I didn't want to say it then because I really wanted to verify. He was like, but you're the first one. And I was like, okay, this is weird. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, yeah. What, were you more proud or were you more disappointed? I was disappointed because I know that there are so many great people who have come before me. And it's so it's one of those things to say, it's a bittersweet thing to be the first in 2013. You just think yeah. how, how, how much time has to last before humans start to just get this right? You know, have there been more since since you left? Right. So literally, I put a post on Facebook, because I was so upset by it. And I said, I just found out I'm the first. Um, you know, black female anesthesiologist to be hired by NUSC. I was like, but I refuse to be the last. So flood me with your cousins, your sisters, your um, for yeah. mentors, right? Like, I want to flood the system. Sometimes I get on social media and just let out this frustration. And all of a sudden, um, someone else, how do you say, reposted it? Mm-hmm. And they cleaned it up and made it a nice, um, a smoother <laughs> version of it. And then that, that post went viral and then everything is kind of spun off of that. So, And then you left, but you're still in the South. Right. Now I'm at the University of Virginia. How, yeah. Tell me how your experience has been being a Black woman in these medical systems in the South. Right. Well, um, because I'm the first here too. <laughs> so, um, Oh my goodness. It, wow. Right. I mean, the University of Virginia has a name about it, right? There's, um, yeah, it's been, it's, it's one of the oldest universities in the country. Um, and so it's one of those odd things because I'm, I'm the first and I'm the only one here at the University of Virginia as far as the critical care anesthesiologist. Um, and then in, in the entire anesthesia department, I'm the only black person. We have two black residents this, within our cycle this year. It makes it where, um, you find your tribe of people in a different way. They may not have the same life experience as you, but one thing I can say is that both institutions have been really supportive of when I say, okay, I'm going to have a difficult conversation with you all about um, racial inequities. I'm going to have a very difficult conversation when I, when I point out the ways that this department itself is racist, but Mm. I would rather hurt feelings than allow for disparities to continue. So Whenever you're ready, let's all sit down and hold hands because yeah, <laughs> we got to buckle up. Yeah, that's how it's but been. It's, but it's a, a unpaid work. Oh, completely. Helping I them mean, fix the system is not, you're, you're not compensated for that. You have, that's above and beyond the job oh, that you have there, but you still do completely, it. Completely, completely. And it's not only um, unpaid work, there's a cost because what, if you look at the works of Dr. Keisha Bentley Edwards, she is the one that published the study that showed um, infant mortality associated with a mother's race and educational level. And what I said in the beginning of the uh, podcast was that, you know, my child is twice as likely to die than a white woman with a third grade education. And um, and what Dr. Keisha Bentley-Edwards is quoted as saying is that 
when you're the only one or if you're one of the few in an elite circle as you make this climb up this ladder Mm -hmm. that there's a a cost to be paid and unfortunately for for black women that added stress of being the only one in the room and having to carry this torch to say stop killing us or or help us fix this system when you're screaming that loud it does impact your your stress hormones. It is a fight or flight situation every single day. And it yeah. leads to hypertension, diabetes, your your children dying. Um, it leads to cancer formation. You know, we know that black women have literally higher cancer mortality in every single state of the United States of America. Um, yeah, it shows up in ways that can't be necessarily quantified sometimes, but it's definitely there. Yeah. Yet you choose to continue this work. Right. Well, because I match the demographic of those that are dying. Right. I mean, it's like yeah. it's literally at, at one point it's altruistic, but at the same time, it's, it's very selfish because, mm. like I said, I'm I'm trying to fix a system that if God blesses me with a child, I don't want to have the same outcome as what my brother's was. And so how do you remain quiet when you're a part of the system and yet at the end of the day, when I take off my white coat, I am a black woman fully. My name literally means black, right? <laughs> um, it's it's who I am, and it's I wouldn't want to change this for the world. And it's how do you get a system to also appreciate the beauty in that? So you told us about how you aim to collaborate with your colleagues and bosses. How do you deal with patients, racist patients? Ooh, that is tough um, because it happens. Um, you, you know, you I had a patient one time I can remember that had literally a uh, white power tattooed on his chest and he was in my cardiac ICU um, back wow. home. I, I was called MUSC back home because I was raised there pretty much. But um, but it's one of those things of at the end of the day, he actually thanked me for um, helping to save his life. But what I always try to think is that I'm meeting this person in this moment of time. And that this moment will pass. But what I am very protective of, though, is that this moment is is still relevant for my life. And so when it comes out, especially my trainees, I do not tolerate racism within the hospital. If there is a patient that is being racist and and it's not an emergent situation, um, and particularly if you're racist against my med students or my residents that I am literally tasked with protecting, um, then we need to talk about you getting um, transferred to another hospital because we have dehumanized medical providers to a point of where we say you just need to take it because you need to do what's best for the patient. But in that moment, you become the patient. Um, and what we know is that every year, 300 to 400 doctors commit suicide every single year. And it's because of that lack of humanity that's given afforded to us, whether it's through patient interaction or work hour duties sacrifices of life experience because you miss holidays and time with families and your sleep weight cycle. So I try to be protective as much as I can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about being a woman? I'm sure there's a lot of the patriarchy still in the South that doesn't respect women in (laughs) positions of power. Right. And I'm not even sure if it's just in the South anymore. Um, you know, because we yeah. oftentimes say it's in the South, even with racism, we say, oh, it's in the South. But if you look at the, the data, it'll show you that, I mean, health outcomes are the same throughout this country. And I don't know if that's because now the mobilization of persons, I've lived in South Carolina, I've lived in Virginia, both of which are South. Um, although sometimes I feel like Charlottesville isn't as much of the South as Charleston. <laughs> but, but, you know, you see differences in how women are treated versus men, which is so weird because you think about it. I mean, women birth, we birth nations, right? <laughs> um, I mean, literally, there would be no generation without a woman <laughs> giving birth to it. So, of course, we can run a nation, but for of whatever course. reason, of course, it's like, it, it's weird to me that we don't have a female dominated society. Um, because of the fact that since you can birth a nation and since your child can literally come out every hue of the rainbow and every religion group, right, um, that you automatically have empathy for the, the person next to you in some form or fashion, mm-hmm. right? So um, so how is it that we haven't taken over, but maybe we'll do that in 2022? Okay. Start. <laughs> top, top of the list, top of the right. list. Right. 
<laughs> so right. how how has your work changed since COVID? And tell us about the staying alive um, community outreach that you spearheaded during the pandemic. Right. right. So um so COVID, you know, it was one of those things where I was screaming um in the very beginning, where are the tests falling along racial lines? Where who are we testing? Who are we actually affording the privilege and the luxury of being tested? Because we know there's been a bias in that along the way for anything from cancer screenings, you name it, there's been a bias in who actually gets tested for different disease processes. And um, and I kept tweeting that and I was very new to Twitter. I didn't know how it even worked. But finally, someone from BuzzFeed wrote and said, I see you keep writing about this. Um, there are no numbers. So how are you so certain that there is a racial health disparity? I was like, oh, well, let me tell you. <laughs> and, I, and I just started, you know, rambling off to her. And she um, she wrote up an article and Elizabeth Warren retweeted it. And from there, there was just this snowball effect of just interview after interview. Um, and it was kind of crazy how it all happened. But from there, my, my friend, Leanne Webb, who is one of the um, ED physicians here, black female physician, and the only one in her department, too, um, at the University of Virginia, we we're like, we have to get information out to our community because right now no one's talking to them. No one's telling them um, what's to come and we know what's going to come. And so we printed out this flyer that basically um, stated how does COVID, how does it present? How do you prepare your house for it? And how do you prevent it? Right. And, and had all these tidbits and facts and an uh, area where you could list um, different places for local health resources, because we, again, we know that um, there's a disparity there. And so we put it out there and there were groups all over the place that decided to print it out and distribute it within their cities as well. And then like a couple weeks after we had started printing those out and passing along, um, the CDC finally released their first set of data on along the lines of race. And that's where it was pointed out that, yes, at that point, it was six to eight times more likely to die if you were black than if you were white. And it was so sad to me because that was in April. Um, it was just so sad because we shouldn't have to get to the point of having data when we already see the hoof print. I know that's a horse somewhere around here, right? Um, if black and brown people were, you know, black people in particular um, had higher death rates for nine of the 15 leading causes of death before COVID. So we can only assume they're going to have a great insult with COVID. It turned out to be true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was looking at um, some of the data around life expectancy in the U.S. by race and, you know, black Americans had a lower life expectancy due to all these things that you're discussing in general and took an even bigger hit during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and so it went down like three years on average because of COVID. The data point that stood out to me, I wish I had written this down, um, was that actually Hispanic Americans have higher life expectancy than both black Americans and white Americans. Right. And so the interesting thing is, too, if you look at Africans, the, and when I, so there's a difference between black Americans Hmm. Um, I feel and and Africans who are now Americans, meaning um, brand new immigrants, because their health outcomes are also better than white um, Americans. It's their children's and their children's children's that become more aligned of what Black Americans' health outcomes are. Wow. Mm -hmm. And and it's a um, so West Africans. There's tons of data. Um, if you look at Essien, he just now really he's he's another physician that I want to say he's at. Pitt, young black man that does incredible work. But he he released a study um, this year that looked at West African health outcomes because he's also from West Africa. And that tells you, though, that it's not genetics that black people have an issue with that we're fighting against. It literally is what um, a, a philosopher out of um, Congaree, I'm probably getting that wrong, but he coined a phrase called necropolitics. And these are policies that we know have a direct negative outcome on life, but yet they're, they're done anyway. Flint, Michigan water crisis can be an example mm -hmm. of that, right? Um, but if you look at even COVID, the influence of politics on health outcome becomes so crystal clear for me. So you have to think about why is it that black and brown people were more likely to be infected in the first place if it were not for the influence of poverty and the fact that their their jobs where everyone else got to be protected at home on Zoom, we say, yeah, but black and brown people, you essential workers, need you to go ahead and get on out there. 
because we got a country to still run, right? And and then when they returned home, they returned home to without be, masks, by the way, without the masks, early, early pandemic, yeah, without masks, without testing offered at those at those centers. If you know that you're going to force the grocery stores to stay open, then shouldn't you have a testing center right there for every employee as they walk through the door? But you didn't do it because you didn't care. And then you look at where those persons lived, and it's in multi generational homes of where if you get infected and you come into this house then you're infecting everyone within your apartment complex, right? Um, and we know that we're relying on healthcare. So your cousin is coming to pick up your child so that you can go to work and it's, it's spread amongst that community. And so you had that impact of why you got infected in the first place. And then the impact of why you died in the first place or had more pre-existing conditions, then that's when you really dive into the social determinants of health and the impact of redlining and the fact that yeah. you're four times less likely to have a grocery store and you're, you're twice as likely not to have a, a hospital within your community. And the fact that, you know, the in, environmental racism and the industrialization that is allowed to happen in your zip code, but not in the wealthy zip code that I live in now. I don't see billows of smoke. Um, I don't even see power lines where I live, which is which was interesting to me <laughs> when I yeah. first, you know, crossed You're over. Like, do we have electricity? I don't see any of the lines. <laughs> it's like, where are the lines? I mean, but it's incredible the difference that zip code will make and the influence and the power of money is actually quite sad. Yeah. And yeah. it's gotten worse. Completely. I mean, even if you look at the design of the CDC, I, I really tweet against them. And it's funny because I have... um like every two or three weeks, we have a meeting with the CDC and the White House Task Force um, where they talk to some of us who are on TV about what is to come. And I tell them after every meeting, you know, I'm going to I'm going to write you on Twitter for everyone to see about how these policies are racist. But and what I mean by mm. that, the phase rollout, the phase one A was for um, healthcare workers and nursing home residents of which we know that healthcare workers, 60% are white and nursing home residents, because it costs money to place your family members there, they're 77% white. And then when they went to phase 1B, that was when you were talking about 65 and older, although we know that there's a paucity of life for Black Americans in this country and that the average life expectancy was only 72 at the time. Um, And then they had for the essential workers, but unfortunately by April of 2020, less than 50% of all Black adults actually had a job. So they base this life-saving intervention on age and employment, of which we know both of which have negative factors yeah. for Black people. I mm-hmm. hadn't thought about that, but did you suggest maybe an age-adjusted, when they said 65 and above, did you suggest they age-adjust it based on lifespan for different groups? Completely. What I, what I suggested was literally black people have higher death rates in every single age category. Our children are five times more likely to die if they're black versus white. And so what I told them was we know there are certain independent risk factors, meaning that regardless, holding all things the same, these things make you more likely to die. Their age and their race. And what they did is they based the policy on age. They have no problem with saying, oh, yeah. And and initially, phase 1B was 75 and older. And again, I said the life expectancy for Black people was 72. And they finally skirted it down to 65 to try to be more inclusive. Although, if you're 65 and older in the United States of America, 78% of them are white. Black people don't live that long. Um, Wow. So I told them, you know, truly, I feel like it's a civil rights violation when you think wow. about the fact that taxpayer dollars, black dollars, I, I give a check every every month to the United States government to say, here's money, do what's best for me, too, right? Um, mm-hmm. So if race is an independent risk factor and age is an independent risk factor and you only chose one to list as a priority, then you are effectively saying that you're okay with the fact that black people are two to three times more likely to die in every single age category. And you don't want to do anything to to address it and to fix it. And I find that to be a problem. Yeah. What was the response? Well, actually, I I can't name names, but there was a a very prominent person that we've all grown to know that was very much in agreement with that. I would say that part. Okay. And and so I'm hopeful because there's a lot even in the intersection, intersectionality of gender and race even, because you hear often that, oh, 
men have worse outcomes with COVID than women. But the reality is, is that Black women are three times more likely to die than white men from COVID. Wow. Yes. Interesting. Um, Right. I mean, there's the intersection of of gender and race leaves Black women to be the silent victim of, of disparities over and over again. We'll be right back after the break. Has your chronic illness made it difficult to continue working in the traditional way? Want to learn how to find and create flexible remote work that both accommodates your chronic illness and generates an income? Join the Patients Getting Paid membership, a community of chronicpreneurs where people just like you find workshops and trainings, weekly updated condition-specific gigs, twice monthly coaching calls, co-workings, accountability, and the kindest community to support you on your path to make money while working from anywhere and taking good care of yourself. Learn more or join us at patientsgettingpaid.com. So tell us about the two other amazing black women you work with at Goodstock Consulting. Yes, hello, my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> so um, at Goodstock Consulting, it was actually the brainchild of Dr. Kimberly Butler Willis. Um, she's the director at Ryan White Center, actually in Charleston, South Carolina. And then we have Kelly McKenzie, who is like the heart and soul, the most organized person you ever want to meet. And both of them, they are heavily rooted in the um, public health sector. So they, they work with Try, uh, Try to United Way. And, and like I said, Kim, Kim is actually with their Roper um, hospital system. And we would always get together over brunch and conversation would inevitably end up on some form of disparity, whether that was health, whether that was housing, whether that was, you know, what's going on with, with wealth gap. And we were all, I think, equally frustrated that the persons in the room that were tasked with creating the solutions for these problems did not look like us. And they, they didn't look like the most disparaged, right? Because if you're underwater, there's nothing you won't do to be able to get to the top so you can breathe, right? And it's the same thing with these disparities. We don't want to be, be without houses. We don't want to die at higher rates. We don't want our children to die at higher rates. And so because we've had to navigate this system so well, those persons that are the most vulnerable They are the ones that actually have the solutions because they know where all the flaws are. They know what keeps them from rising to the top. Um, So we decided let's start a a consulting business where we can talk to different industries, agnostic to industry, actually. um, But talk to them about let's see how we can strategize to make this a more inclusive um, society so that we can all rise because we know a rising tide lifts all boats. And when you take care of the most vulnerable all of us benefit, right? So, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's what we've been doing now for a couple of years. Yeah, I like that you guys are, um, you know, I think a lot of time women, and I'm sure especially Black women, are mm-hmm. asked to do this work for free on top of their day job. This right. is a huge problem with diversity and inclusion programs within large corporations. And so what I love is that now when people ask to pick your brain or, <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, get your help for free, you can point to this organization and say, pay me. Like, we can do the work for you. Just just pay us. Right. I mean, because it it is phenomenal to me uh, to even think about how much women in general are asked to do things that we know don't benefit as far as the climb up the ladder within your organization um, in academia, it's always an issue because we get asked to be the mentors, which is fantastic because you want to give to the next generation, but it has that doesn't do anything to advance me in my career. And they're like, oh, but you're motherly. It's like, what is that? He can be fatherly. Let, let him be fatherly. <laughs> um, so, but it, it's one of those because what we're trying to do now is, um, to establish a new norm in all sense of the word of what it means to be black in corporate America to say that, no, we're, we're not just there as a, as a think piece for you. Um, we actually want to be the leaders in the room, put us at the table. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, while, and once we get at that table, our motto is that we, um, we take a seat at the table and then we bring a bench because we, we insist that we're now going to load this place. Just like I said, back in 2013, Bring me your sisters, your cousins, your friends. I want everyone. We're going to flood this place because we know what diversity 
of lived life experience. Yes, I have all these degrees on my wall, but that my greatest asset I bring to any table is literally what was it like to be the middle child of a single parent who couldn't afford to pay for you to have a, a pediatrician? What did you learn along the way? Because there's a wealth of knowledge that doesn't come in the form of a book. Oh, absolutely. Well, and the empathy that you bring for patients from your similar background. Oh, completely. You've been there. You know the questions to ask. You don't judge. There's no, there's no class divide. None. I mean, and and like I said, it's regardless of of race, especially up here in Virginia. um, I feel like I have more white patients than I do any other race. And there's, there's some that have, that come from a pretty poverty stricken background. And I understand when you come in and you have now a, a dissection of your aorta and we're trying to work with blood pressure meds and we're, we're having to give you four or five, I can sit down with you and say, let's talk about how can we help to get you blood pressure medicine to your house? I don't even, I don't even want you to have to tell me. I'm going to, I'm going to tell yeah. you because there's a, there's a stigma and a, and a shame that should not be there. But it's, but it's one of those things where um, it's like, let me sit down with you and we're going to figure this out um, so yeah. that we can, again, regardless of race, we're going to break these generational curses by addressing the system and and showing how it doesn't work for you. Yeah. So in June of 2020, a lot of organizations, including hospitals, promised to invest in this area um, on behalf of their organizations. Do you feel like they've come through with this promise of investing? Do you feel like large organizations, especially healthcare organizations, have started to dismantle the systemic racism that is built into their constitutions? I think we center the privilege where our actions and we state equity in theory, meaning that um, I think people have fantastic intentions. But if you're in a million dollar neighborhood and they say they're going to put a a Habitat for Humanities um, duplex right across the street from you, people have issues with it, right? Um, They want to help, but just not not at my doorstep kind of way. Mm -hmm. I think in June, 2020, there were a lot of efforts, but I tell you, it's the amount of, of red tape you have to go through to actually get someone to want to support your work. Um, you're, you're also having to compete with persons that have been in industry for 10, 20 years because they could, right? Uh, Like I said, with Kimberly and Kelly and myself, we're all doing this as our our second and third jobs um, because we know yeah. there's a, a need for it. And we are trying to now actually um, get to a position where we can fully um, employ Kelly and Kim to do this work exclusively because we do find that is so important. But there's a lady, I can't remember her name now, who ended up having 95% of her town vaccinated. I want to say she was in Mississippi. Um, and a o- little old lady and she said that she was going door to door, knocking on doors. Uh-huh. And and it's like that much effort in the city. If, if, if it was that great that you you actually had to take the time to write this up in a newspaper. What did you give her to compensate for that task that the local health department should have been doing? Yeah. What did what did you give her for hazard pay? The fact that she was mm. exposing herself potentially to COVID to try to do what again the local health department didn't do and the likelihood that they didn't do it in the the hospital system because they probably didn't have a hospital in their community um it's just like yeah. in in South Carolina i mean there's there's eight um counties uh, and it might even be nine now uh, counties without a single hospital in the entire county and then another 15 um have less than 100 acute care beds in there so that's that's literally half the state that's completely underserved. And it takes persons like that little old lady going door to door to keep that community alive. And yet the efforts are given a mentioned in a newspaper, which is fantastic, but that won't pay her bills. That won't yeah. keep her food on the table. Um, but it's something that it, it's looked at like, oh, well, that's what she's supposed to do. Um, no. Yet the amount of money that she actually saved the state. Oh my God. The amount of Can lives that she saved. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine the, the amount of businesses and restaurants that were still allowed to open, the the, yeah. the transit system that didn't shut down because of the fact that their essential workers were still allowed to go out and, and work. Those things are taken for granted day in and day out. And and when we talk about, when you say in June 2020, my question um, has been for 
the administration as well as our state entities, we had all these plan B options of health care for black and brown community this entire time. Although Brown versus the Board of Education proved in the 1950s that Seven Bar Eagle does not work, we had hospitals in certain communities and we had mobile clinics set up in the church parking lot, in the barber shops, in the grocery stores. We had mobile little vans everywhere to do this COVID testing and vaccination sites. But since we've now been in here in this this pandemic for two years, almost, right, um, has a, a single new hospital been built? Has a single clinic, has a brick been placed in those same communities where you knew there was such a lack that you went and knocked on the doors and asked pastors, hey, can we borrow your church? Because we don't have anything here for for this entire community, right? But the answer is no, we have not changed the system at all. Yeah. So you you started a petition for the Biden administration to create and appoint what you call a secretary of equity. Uh, Is this kind of the first step in in realizing equity, health equity? And what do you envision this role to be? I envision, so this Department of Equity, if we think about the Department of Defense and the Department of Transportation, Department of Education, um, I mean, the Department of Defense in itself is $700 billion, 714, I think, or $40 billion um, every year, you know, to this department. If we had a tenth of that to go to a Department of Equity, where literally every policy that comes out of the Department of Education, every policy from the Department of you know, Education, Transportation, HUD, if we look at those policies to say, hey, with an equity lens, how is this along the lines of race? How is this along the lines of gender? How is this along the lines of, of sexual orientation, LGBTQIA, you know, any marginalized community? How are we making sure that, that those tax paying persons who are giving over money that takes the food out of their children's lives, yeah. how are we making sure that the policy actually goes to benefit them as well? And if it doesn't, we go back to the ground board because we're not going to push this out. Um, and we should be able to repeat that. They're already underpaid, so they should be, you know, Completely. making more money. <laughs> and, Completely. Yeah. I mean, and how do we repeat that? Um, mm-hmm. Not only on the federal level, but also on the state and the local level, every single policy again, that's paid for by taxpayers should have to have a stamp that says that this actually benefits all of them and not just the wealthy. Do you think this is possible? I love this idea. Right, I'm wondering right. if you think it's, is it something that's more a conversation starter or are you like dead serious? Like we really need this I department. Am, I am, I'm as serious as, um, as a heart attack, as my grandma would say. Um, <laughs> it's one of those things because if you think about it, I, I'm, I'm certain that a hundred years ago, we we were certainly, I mean, women, we just now earned the right, well, white women, I got to clarify that, in 1920s, white women, you know, earned yeah. the right to vote um, without without bars um, attached to it. And so it, it took 100 years, but who would have thought, I bet 100 years before that in the 1820s, they would have thought there's no way that, you know, that that we would look the way we did in the 1920s and that women will be trying to use their voice to do things, right? Um, What do you mean? And so fast forward now, we're in 2020, where again, in the 1920s, there was a separation and a divide that was was truly great in terms of of race and interactions. And yet in 2020, um, we definitely still have problems, but black and white people were walking and marching through the street saying, you know, that Black Lives Matter and, and not today and, you know, and pushing for this, this, this cry towards how do we make ourselves better? So do I think necessarily a um, Department of Equity could happen within this administration? Um, I don't think it will happen. I wish it would. But do I think it will happen before hopefully our children's children um, will have this same conversation on a different podcast? I hope so. Right. Do you think um, it'll happen before we have a woman president? I think we'll have a woman president. Um, well, you know, it's it may be, take her to create this department. It may, and it likely will, because again, that's I feel like that's the way women, and I'm using very much a stereotype, um, because we are all are different. But, um, but I feel like in large, that's the way women think. We think in terms of how do we balance all this, right? How do you balance 
motherhood and working and friendships and taking care of myself and taking care of the, you know, your partner, like how, how do you, how do you make sure that you're carrying this whole load and doing it in a way that keeps everyone as quote unquote happy as possible, right? As balanced as possible. I think we're just set up just, I said it a tiny bit, just different because literally that's what we're created to do. Yeah. Yeah. Is the petition still up? Can people still go sign it? It is. It's on um, change.org okay. um, under um, Secretary of Equity. And I need to actually post it back on Twitter again. But it's yeah. it's one of those things until we continue this conversation of what next, because what I fear more than anything else is that when this pandemic ends, we go back to life as usual and life as mm-hmm. usual for the black and brown community was anything but um, acceptable. We got to fix things. So yeah. how can people follow your work? Oh, no. <laughs> so um, many different ways, actually. With, with Good Stock Consultant, we actually have a podcast called The B Word Unpacked. Um, it's on Apple, Spotify, um, the usual platforms. Um, we're also on Twitter. I'm on Twitter a lot uh, under Ebony J. Hilton. <laughs> I know. And you're new, to, you're new to Twitter, too, right? Like you've oh, only been on for like two years, but you're you've just like taken off. When I tell you I had no clue how it worked, um, February 2020, I went to New York, and this is before I knew the pandemic was going to be what the pandemic was, but I went yeah. to New York to see Oprah and, um, and Michelle Obama book tour, and Oprah, Oprah got on stage, and she was like, you guys tweet this, tweet this, and I was like, oh, I guess I need to reactivate my Twitter thing, because I got to, yeah. I mean, she told me to tweet it, so I'm going yeah. to tweet this, and her, her um, phrase was, is this one day or day one? You know, when we say one day, I'm going to do this. She was like, no, you know, you have mm. to consider, is this one day or is this day one? And um, so I tweeted that. And that was, like I said, February 9th, 2020. Um, yeah. And by March, March was when I was like, okay, I know this is going to be a problem as far as this pandemic. Let me get to just, I guess, writing on this Twitter and seeing <laughs> if this tweet tweets or something. <laughs> <laughs> Med Twitter is a really awesome group. Um, oh, I love it. I've, I've yeah. talked to several doctors, and yeah. having an outlet for advocacy seems to be something that is um, on the agenda for more people. So, Dr. Margot right. Michelle with homelessness, and Dr. Uh, Megan Ranny around gun violence, and these oh, are yeah. yeah, these are these are doctors that are using heavy hitters. Yeah, I mean it's it's a great it, it is a great platform in, in many ways. I also know some people that have had to get off it from just trolls being overwhelming. Mm-hmm. I hope, mm-hmm. um, you know, I hope you don't have to deal with that too much, but. Oh, it's one of those, honestly, I, I tell people I'm a fire sign. Um, and I know Michelle Obama, she said it at the conference. She said, you know, we need to go high when they go low, but I yeah. need to get on eye level sometimes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, because, but, but in, in honesty, it was um, like literally this past Friday, there was a person that wrote and said, our COVID cases are low in, in Florida. Why are you not commenting on that? And um, and we went back and forth. I was like, what do you mean why I'm not commenting on it? Um, first of all, Florida, one in every five persons in Florida, one in five has now been infected with COVID. One in every 340 has now died from COVID. Um, at this point, when a forest fire runs through the forest, when all the trees are ashes, the fire stops. Yeah. It's not a, you know, not a, a great mm. thing. But yeah. um, by the end of the discussion, because it was going back and forth. And I finally made a comment um, that gave her a good analogy of, of how COVID has really ran through the um, that state. She was like, oh, she was like, okay, I understood that. And she was like, you know, um, thank you for, for talking to me. I really appreciate this. Wow. Like, yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, so yeah, you just, I mean, uh, you're gonna, I who, who do you send the bill to? <laughs> right. H- HHS. They can take right. it. I was like, oh, but it's having those difficult conversations yeah. where you get frustrated. Um, yeah. That now oh, yeah. we hopefully have a new community advocate. So. Oh, good. Well, I heard a funny, um, a funny tweet that said when, when they go low, I go medium because God is still working on me. <laughs> right. <laughs> is, I'm a work in progress. <laughs> uh, you know, like I said, I like to get, I like to get eye level just so we can make sure we see each other. I don't want you to, you know. <laughs> but, um, well, to anyone listening, you can follow Dr. Hilton. Yes. She's Ebony Jade Hilton underscore MD on Twitter. Mm-hmm. Um, and Goodstock Consulting is... Goodstock underscore LLC. 
So Dr. Hilton, thank you so much for your time today. It was so wonderful speaking to you. And if you're listening, please subscribe to the Heart of Healthcare. um, And we look forward to talking to you next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Heart of Healthcare. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, follow us on social, and tell all your friends to listen. The Heart of Healthcare is a product of Offscript Health. We are a healthcare engagement company built for patients and caregivers by patients and caregivers. Our executive producers are Matthew Zachary and Andrew McDowell. Our senior producer is Brianna Seeley. Our intern is Antonella Sterniolo. Our host is Hallie Tecco. It is recorded, mixed, and edited by Brianna Seeley. For advertising and media inquiries, email media at offscriptnot.com. That's media at offscript.com. For more information, visit offscript.com. Dot com.